Hi, GBC. My name's Ryan. And my name is Saint. Thanks for tuning into our online service. Now, Saint, we both lead worship we and do. sing in front of a lot of people. Yes. Uh, what's your most embarrassing moment singing in front of a group? Oh, boy. I have several to pull from on that one. I would say the most notable one is one where I forgot the words to a worship song, which happens very frequently. Um, but this time I replaced the words like Jesus and me. So it was like very heretical and just an awful experience. Mm. So I'm so sorry to anyone who was at that service. I promise I read the Bible. Um, so that was just one of them. Mm. Yes. Well, those are an embarrassing moment for us as worship leaders, but what's an embarrassing moment that you've had in front of a large group of people? Maybe you're singing, maybe you weren't. But feel free to talk about that with the people that might be around you. Well, hopefully your story isn't too traumatizing for you, but as we move forward, just a few announcements for you guys. As a reminder, many of our service times, they've changed and the protocols have changed with them at both of our campuses. Now first, if you're at the Maple Campus, the service times are at 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m., and 11 a.m. The Refuge Campus is going to continue to meet at 10 a.m. as it always has. Now, if you're at the Maple Campus and you want to go to the 8 a.m. service, make sure that you sign up ahead of time. There's going to be mask and social distance protocol for that service only. Our other services are going to be mask optional with no advanced sign-up required. However, if your kids want to be a part of the Grace Kids Ministry, they're going to need to sign up ahead of time, and you can do that through the website. Absolutely, and there are three more Sundays in our open registration period for our Grace Groups, which is the small group ministry here at GBC. So we have groups for every age and stage of life, so please go ahead and pick up a registration form at one of our in-person services or contact Pastor Alex at abrt at gracea2.org. Now, if you'd like to stay up to date on all of the exciting things happening at GBC, including the upcoming camp out, then make sure that you subscribe to The Loop. It's our e-newsletter, and if you're interested in that, go to graceA2.org slash loop so you can get all that info. And finally, we believe that giving is an act of worship, so you may give online at graceA2.org slash give or by mailing your offering to our 1300 South Maple Road address. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for uh, the ability to just gather as a church through these online services that time and space uh, don't separate us from engaging with your word uh, and just having your spirit shape us. And so we ask that you would do that today as we watch the sermon and as we listen to the worship songs, that you would just move in us and make us more like you. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
My missions trip students had gone off to bed and I was talking with the missions director at CCCD, which is one of the ministries that we support, and we were sitting in this humid kind of cafeteria room. It was dimly lit, there were bugs circling the lights, and we were just making small talk. As we were talking, this young couple who happened to be teachers at the school walked in singing. Now, they had beautiful voices, but they were not anticipating an audience. So when they came in, they immediately said, oh, we're so sorry, we, and they were apologizing for interrupting our conversation, and they stopped singing. And we told them, you know, you guys sounded great, that was awesome, you don't have to stop on our account, and they just sort of laughed, and they sat at the table with us, and we all started to talk. Well, as we were talking, somehow the conversation went back to singing, and Warren and I, the director and I, as we were talking to them, we, we, were, we were saying, okay, so why don't you guys sing us a song? And, and, and they're like, well, what would you want us to sing? And we said, well, how about the Jamaican National Anthem, you know? And, and they said, oh, and they kind of looked at each other and they said, okay. And they began to sing for us the Jamaican National Anthem. And they did a fantastic job. They were very, very good at singing. Well, when they were done, we kind of clapped for them and we said, oh, thanks, you know. And, and then they looked at us and they said, okay, now it's your turn. And as soon as they said that, the blood just drained right out of my face. And, and we said, wait, wait, what? Our, our turn to do what? And they said, well, you have to sing us a song so much. And I said, well, I wouldn't even know what to sing. And they said, sing your national anthem. And I said, ours? And they said, yeah, we love that one. That's like one of our favorites. Go ahead and sing your national anthem. Well, I, I looked at Warren and I looked at them to try to determine if they were actually being serious. And, and I began to try to talk my way out of it. Now listen, time out. I know the national anthem. Some people are like, oh, you stand up, don't stand up. Like it can, but this was not one of those moments, okay, of those kinds of, this was just two people holding their hands on the table, looking at us, waiting. As I said, well, come on. They said, listen, we sang for you. Now you sing for us. It's only fair. And so I looked at Warren. I said, well, what, what, what do you think? And we turned and we began to attempt to sing together the National Anthem. Now, I don't know if you've ever sung the National Anthem with anyone else before or before an audience, but if you pick the wrong key of that song, it can be awful. By the time you get to the land of the free, you might prefer to hear bombs bursting in air because if you're in the wrong key, it, just, just look out. And so we tried to pick a key that would work and then we sang it for them and there we were, two 30-ish-year-old Americans with meager musical talent, 
singing what may have been the only rendition of the U.S. national anthem on the island that night. And even as I was singing, I realized, you know what, we are representing something. We are representing our country, like some ideals. Like there's something more happening in this moment than just us trying to carry a tune. Now music is powerful. It has the ability to represent something far larger than we are. When we raise our voices, certainly when we do that together, it is a full body experience that is more than just something that sounds pretty. We are in our last week of the Father's House series. From the very beginning, we've said that God's presence, His very Spirit, in the Bible, you can track God's spirit and his presence and kind of where God is. And he's, he, he, he's on a mountaintop and in a tabernacle and in a temple. But in the New Testament, we find out that the very presence of God, his spirit goes and dwells among his people. That we, in a sense, become the Father's house. We are the place around which people can gather to meet our great Savior, Jesus so we've been talking about that in this house, in the Father's house, we don't just say sorry, we repent. In the Father's house, we're on the same team. In the Father's house, we pray expectantly. In the Father's house, we encourage each other. In the Father's house, we boldly witness. And then last week, we talked about how we are generous as members of the Father's house. Well, today, I want to talk about something that maybe for some of us doesn't seem that significant. Like it doesn't seem on the same level as repentance or generosity. And yet, it's a huge, huge deal that in this house, we sing. We sing together. Music is powerful. Singing is a significant part of what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Now, this singing might look different. I mean, obviously, if someone doesn't have the ability to sing and they can sign, but, but in some way, using our bodies to, to lift you know, for most of us, our voices together is a significant act of worship. In the Father's house, we sing. A quick look at the Bible will show you that singing mattered quite a bit to faithful Jewish folks. I mean, right in the very middle of the Bible is their song book called the Psalms. Now, we tend to just read those or study those or think about those a little bit. But they, those were the songs that they would sing together. That's how significant it was in that ancient library that we call the Bible that right in the middle, the largest book in the, whole, in the whole Bible, is the Psalms. Singing is a big deal. Now, we've been mostly in the early chapters of Acts, and you can certainly see singing in the book of Acts, like with Paul and Silas in, in, in prison. But I really would, I want to dive into a text in Ephesians today, Ephesians, which is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And in this text, I want us to just kind of break it down into three parts, and we're going to look at it in these three parts. Part one, a dangerous world. Part two, a call to be filled. And part three, the power of a song. So let's start with this dangerous world that, that the Apostle Paul is speaking into. Now, to give you a little bit of context, there's this brilliant guy by the name of Paul who penned this beautiful letter to a church, a small church, which was in Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey. And this is a church that he helped start or plant or begin. And so he had helped it get going and then he traveled off to do more ministry and then he sent a letter back to give them more instructions on what it meant to follow Jesus. And as you read through this letter, it starts with him really laying out the whole grand story of the gospel. He, he spends time talking about how, what it means to be a child of God. That you are saved when the Holy Spirit stirs you to know that this great God of ours sent Jesus to this earth to live the life we should have lived, to die the death that we all deserve, and then to raise again to life. And when we have our hearts stirred to faith in Christ, we become, in, in the Apostle Paul's words, a new creation. It's not just that we go, oh, here's some new things that I need to do. No, no, we become brand new people empowered by God's very spirit to be the people who he wants us to be, to walk in the way he wants us to walk. And so in faith, our reality is changed as we're rescued from sin and death. We are given this inheritance, which will be in heaven. 
But we're also given power right now to take steps of faith in following Jesus. And so Paul is giving them now the instructions. So here's how you should kind of walk. Here's how you should live in the reality of your faith. And that's where we are in Ephesians chapter 5. And this is what it says in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, that might sound a little clunky. So here's the paraphrase from the message. This might be a little bit easier to grasp. Here's what it says from the message version. So watch your step. Use your head. Make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the master wants. Now, while the message does a little bit better job, both of these sort of have this like, be careful, watch your step. It, when, I, when I hear those sorts of phrases, it kind of gives me a sense of, well, timidity, right? Like, be careful out there. You don't know, can you approach this dog? It might bite, right? Like, ooh, walk in. But I, I don't think, I don't think that's what the Apostle Paul is referring to here. He's not talking about a lack of courage. I think he's talking more about the need for focus. So he's not saying be scared out there. He's saying be aware out there. One of our first real stops on our recent family vacation was the Badlands. Have, have you ever been to the Badlands? They are so surreal. It's like being on the moon or something. It's very strange. You go from these kind of green rolly fields to just these sort of painted rocky spires and cliffs. And at one of the first places, we took this little scenic road. There was an, out, an overlook where you could go. And of course, the overlook had this little like boardwalk thing to a little fenced platform where you could take nice pictures. Well, you know, as we looked around, we saw that not everybody was going that way. And generally speaking, uh, if they were young teenager types, they were all kind of going off the boardwalk. They wanted to go get closer to the cliff edge. Well, having three sons who are kind of that age to take those kind of risks, Immediately, they had no interest in the little boardwalk and the platform. They wanted to go see how close they could get to the edge. Now, I don't like heights, okay? There's no part of me that, that wants to get close to that edge, really. But what I didn't do as they walked out there, and there was a spot where you could walk on a path that was, I mean, literally probably, you know, one and a half to two feet wide with a sheer cliff on either side. No handrails, nothing like that. As they were going there, I didn't go, look out, because I didn't want to frighten them off of the edge, right? But I did say things like, guys, pay attention. Pay attention now. That's a long ways down. You know, don't go out there if you're not totally sure of your feet. Now, be smart, guys. Be smart. I mean, I probably said that a hundred times. And that's really, I think, what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He's saying, pay attention. No, look out. He's not, this is not like frightened, scared stuff. He's just saying, pay attention now. Be smart. Be smart out there because in the SV version, it says the days are evil. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, I think what Paul is doing is he's saying that as Jesus followers, they need to work hard to stay focused on living right because there are so many opportunities to get sucked into the nonsense, the chaos, and the danger of the world around them. There's so many ways that a person can go wrong. You have to stay focused on the truth. It is like this world is just constantly like luring us to different philosophies and to walk on different paths. And he's saying, guys, be smart now, pay attention because it is desperate times in the message version. It is dangerous out there. Now, do we live in a world that is dangerous right now? I would say so. We live in a world right now that has myriad distractions, confusions, and dangers. Between the constant barrage of news stories, of political tensions, of COVID protocols, of racial unrest, of relational strife or isolation, we live in this world that for many of us feels like it is filled with struggle and doubt and confusion, cynicism, anger. There are times where I just am like, hey, go to bed world, you're drunk, right? Like it's crazy in our world right now. Well, 
What do you think Papa Paul would say to us living in this particular world? If he saw how attached we are to social media accounts, right? Or how much news we consume. Or if he heard the hours of podcasts that we listen to or, or the articles that we read. What do you think he would say to us? Well, my guess is he would say, pay attention, be smart. Pay, pay, pay attention. Because this world is like, whew, you know, like just, just now be smart, pay attention. And if we were like, oh, Paul, you're, you're saying, um, pay attention to my Facebook notifications? Pay attention to the news? Like, pay attention to my favorite podcasts and my true crime Netflix addiction? Like, pay attention to that? I'm guessing he would say, um, no. Uh, pay attention to how you're living. Be wise. Make good use of your time. Well, wait a second, Paul. Isn't it a good use of my time to be uh, informed? to be aware, to be entertained, to be stimulated. Isn't that a good use of my time? And I think you might say, well, is the way that you're using your time helping you understand what the will of God is in your life? Is it making you more sensitive to the spirit of God? Is it opening your eyes more and more to the brilliance of who Jesus is? Or is the way you're spending your time just making you dislike half the country? <laughs> make you afraid of the future, make you glazed over to the real truths, numbing your heart to God's leading. Well, what is it actually doing? Be wise now because the days are evil. They're dangerous. They're desperate. It's crazy out there. For you fantasy nerds, there is a powerful scene in the Two Towers movie where Gandalf and crew, they, they go in and they meet, they're meeting this guy by the name of Theoden, who's this king of Rohan, and they go to speak to him. And when you see Theoden, he's like um, this, this older, he's got white hair, he's got kind of cloudy eyes. He's just, his whole countenance, there's, there's something kind of like over him. And there's this kind of creepy dude named Grimma Wormtongue who has been speaking incantations to him and he is held by the spell of all that he is hearing from Wormtongue. And Gandalf and crew approach and then Gandalf with a flurry of words and power does his Gandalf thing and it like snaps, it snaps Theoden out of this this spell. And, and, and all of a sudden, it's like the scale. It's like he can begin to see what is real and what is right in front of him. It's fascinating that the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2 says, no soldier gets entangled in civil, uh, civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Without even knowing it, we live in a dangerous world, right? And it is speaking its incantations, its spells over us daily in the things that we're consuming and listening to. And there's a real danger that our spirits get deadened and that our minds and our hearts become entangled with all of this stuff. Well, what's the antidote to this? Because he says, be careful how you walk. Like, look out for the world. It's evil out there. Make sure you're spending your time wisely. What is his antidote? Well, there's a dangerous world. But there's also in this text a call to be filled, which is our second part, a call to be filled. Here's what it says in verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So the Apostle Paul calls on the church to strive to be wise, to understand the will of God, and then to stay sober, like doesn't that seem like a little bit weird, like a little trite with all this other big stuff? He's, he's like, hey, guys, um, you know, Bible, not booze. Devotions, not drinking. Prayers, not parties. The Holy Spirit, not spirit. <laughs> like, like it seems like a little bit, I don't know, uh, uh, like simplistic. And maybe if you're a, an unchurched person going, I knew it. I knew what the Bible's about. It's about taking away joy and fun things like being able to drink. Blah, blah. Okay, all right, relax Here's what I think is happening here. The Apostle Paul is saying, instead of getting sucked into the nonsense 
and the malaise and the drunkenness of the world and all that it has to offer, make sure instead that you're being filled with the Spirit. He's contrasting getting drunk with wine with being filled with the Spirit. Getting drunk with wine makes you like lose some control, makes you forget who you are. It might give you strong emotions, but those may not align with reality. Being filled with the Spirit gives you more kind of control. It helps you know who you truly are. It, it does fill you with emotion, but it's true joy and peace that corresponds to ultimate reality. And so he's, he's contrasting these things to say, watch out, don't get sucked in to, to all that the world is offering because it, it might just make you drunk and be dangerous, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, everyone who comes to believe in Jesus has the Spirit of God in them. Every single person has God's presence in them when they have come to know who Jesus truly is and what he has done for them. So he's not saying have the Holy Spirit because he's talking to believers here. They already have the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Which brings us to our Bible nerd moment of the day. Now, oftentimes when we do a Bible nerd moment, we're like, hey, this thing in Greek or this thing in Hebrew or whatever. Today, you don't need foreign languages to see this. I, I just want us to look at the English of this verse to notice a few things when it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So first off, here's one part of the Bible nerd. Giving this instruction makes it seem like Paul is suggesting that there's a possibility to somehow have the Holy Spirit and yet not be full of the Holy Spirit. Right? Because he's talking to people that have the Holy Spirit. So it makes it seem like there's a possibility to have the Spirit, but not be particularly full of the Holy Spirit. Second, this instruction is a command. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is like something you have to do. This isn't like, hey, maybe try the Holy Spirit. No, no. If you're walking in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if he's giving this command to us, then who is he giving it to exactly? Well, it is actually a plural all of you, together, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So thirdly, we should notice that this is a command for all of us to do this together, that we should become filled with the Holy Spirit. And then fourth, what he says is, be filled with the Holy Spirit together. And this is in the present tense, which means keep on doing it. So it's not a one-time deal. Like you have to keep together being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, for those of us who have the Holy Spirit in our lives because we have placed our faith in Christ, by God's grace, then we have the Spirit, but we should work together in some way to allow our thoughts and our affections and our desires to be directed towards the person and the work of Jesus. And this is a team project. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It means that the Spirit comes and fills us up together to direct our affections and attentions and desires toward the brilliance of Jesus. Now, I am the husband of a woman named Charity and a father to three sons. Now, it would be possible for me to travel across the country and, I mean, it wouldn't really be possible, but let's just pretend, and to not think about them at all. Like to get on the plane and to just go through, a, you know, my, my queue of my streaming service and just watch one show after the other, after the other, after the other, and never let thoughts of my family come into my mind. And then to get to where I'm going and then just run around and enjoy it and try to do the stuff and never pause to consider them. But just to keep my mind sort of numb and busy and occupied and to never consider them. Now, if I were to do that while I'm on this week of travel, I would still be married to my wife. I would still be father to my children, but my heart would not be particularly focused or filled with my family during that time. Okay, so imagine instead that I'm traveling across the country for a week or whatever, and as I go, I am sitting on the plane, instead of just watching show after show after show, I'm swiping through pictures from the last times we were together. And then I get someplace and every time I see something that's amazing, I, I try to journal so that I can remember the details so that when I'm home with my family, I can share with them the details. When I'm out at a store, I'm looking for little souvenirs to bring home to them so that I, in a way they can kind of be there with me even though they're not really there with me. I can 
actively focus my attention, my thoughts, my affections, and look for ways to communicate love to my family. I can do that, right? I would be married to my wife still. I would be father to those kids still. And yet in that instance, I actually would be more filled with them. This is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. We are to allow the Holy Spirit to direct our attentions, our affections, our thoughts and desires together toward the beautiful work of Jesus. Be careful now. It's dangerous out there. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So how do we do this? Because you can be generous with your money, but it's not the same thing as buying a souvenir for Jesus, right? You, I mean, you can pray, but it still feels a little different than like FaceTiming a family member. You can journal or something, but it's not exactly the same as having a conversation around the dinner table. So, so what does he suggest as a response to being filled, as maybe a tool for being filled, as something that we could do together to really allow this to happen? Well, sing. And which brings us to the power of song. The power of song. It's a dangerous world. There's a call to be filled, and there is power in song. Notice what he says in verse 19. Addressing, so this is right after he says, be filled, right? Don't get drunk, whatever. He says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. In the Father's house... We sing. Now, just like the faithful Jewish Old Testament believers, we are called to sing together. And he uses three different words to describe this. He uses the word psalms, which I'm imagining refers to the Old Testament psalms. He, he uses the word hymns, which as I was reading up some articles from a scholar named Sam Storms, he talked about how the hymns would likely be uh, compositions that people wrote, not the psalms, but people wrote that were kind of contemporaries like uh, Mary's Magnificat in, in the book of Luke or the Christ hymns in Psalm 2 and elsewhere, or in Philippians 2 and elsewhere. And then spiritual songs, he said, would probably refer to kind of extemporaneous songs, kind of songs that were spontaneous or improvised during the worship settings. They were called to sing. It was meant to be this overflow of affection for Jesus and this address to one another. They were they were saying, they were experiencing something, but they were also educating each other in their songs. I mean, there's a sense in which we are teaching each other something when we come together and we sing to each other. When I see and hear somebody that I know that's battling cancer or recently got divorced or lost a loved one or something, and I see and hear them singing, singing worship songs, it is, they're teaching me something in that moment about what it means to love and be faithful to Jesus. Warren Wearsby, in his book, Real Worship, he says this, I'm convinced that congregations learn more theology, good and bad, from the songs they sing than the sermons they hear. Wait, time out. Brantley's not that cool. All right, I'm just kidding. He is. Many sermons are doctrinally sound and contain a fair amount of biblical information, but they lack that necessary emotional content that gets hold of the listener's hearts. Music, however, reaches the mind and the heart at the same time. It has power to touch and move the emotions, and for that reason, can become a wonderful tool in the hands of the spirit or a terrible tool in the hands of the adversary. The music that we share together is deeply, deeply powerful. There's a moving depiction of the power of music in a film called Alive Inside, which won the Audience Award at the Sundance Film Festival in 2014. So I know it's been a little while. But I recently saw a clip from it, and it's about these, these people who have suffered Alzheimer's, and it's taken a lot of their former personality away and some of their memories away. And many of them, by this point in their lives in the, in the film, are kind of just stuck in a bed, laying there, maybe in a chair, they're not doing much. Their heads tend to be down and their eyes tend to be down. They tend to have a little bit of a, almost a cloudy haze. And so some of their caretakers and researchers are trying to figure out how do we connect to these people on a deeper level? And what they came up with was music. And so they took headphones and little iPod shuffles, again, 
2014, and, and they put these headphones on these, these patients and said, would you like to listen to music? And if they, if they kind of nodded or made some motion, yes, they'd put it on and they'd turn it on. And it was immediate. As soon as music started to play, and they had researched like, what is this person's favorite kind of music from family members? You would see their eyes start to change and like, like something was connecting on a deeper level. And all they were doing in that instance was listening to music. Imagine how much deeper still and more powerful it is when we come together and we actually sing together. There is something tremendous that is happening there where it breaks us through that kind of glaze and that fog. It connects our minds and our, our hearts all in one. Singing is a response, right? It, it, it's a response. It, singing and making melody to the Lord. This is verse 19, the oh, second half of 19. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank Him for everything. It's a response. It is this, this, this moment where we just like, it just bursts out of us. We're responding to what we know to be true and what we're passionate about. This is the reason why grown men will sing fight songs in a football stadium. Because the, it's just a response that just comes out of them. This is why poor musicians get inspired to write their lover a song and try to sing it to them. Because, it, because when you're overwhelmed, it just comes out of you. We sing to who God is and what he has done. There's an expression that happens of our love to him that is powerful. And not only is it powerful as it comes out of us, but it is a powerful testimony to the world. It's a response to the world as well. We were on top of Mount Arbel amidst this heavy fog overlooking the whole Galilee area in Israel. And there was just this, we just, God had been moving so powerfully in our hearts, our minds, and uh, we, we'd been learning all kinds of things. And Brantley brought along his guitar and he kind of placed his back to sort of the mountain's edge and we sort of gathered around. And he began to lead us together in singing. And we were really responding to just what, what God had been doing in us. But as we were responding, it also became a response to the world because I may have mentioned this before, but halfway through singing one of the songs in a nearby Muslim village, the Muslim call to prayer went out. And I don't know if you've heard that before, but these little speaker systems and it's got kind of this, this sound to it that catches you off guard if it's the first time. And that started playing that song while we were singing these worship songs. And as we just kept singing, the truth and the power of our overflow became a response to the world. And in many ways, it drowned out this call to prayer that was happening to another God. It was a powerful response moment. Singing is a response. Singing is also relational. What does he say? He says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And then a little bit further down in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There is something deeply relational that happens when we sing together. There's an English Premier League team called Liverpool, and they have this tradition where at some point during the match, maybe it's before, I'm sure some Liverpool fan is screaming, oh, it happens at exactly this point. Sorry, I don't know exactly when. But they sing this song, You'll Never Walk Alone, and they hold their little scarves and whatever. And they all sort of sway and they just sing. And there's something truly relational about that moment where they are coming together and singing the same songs. The same thing happens when I hear us sing together on Sundays. Now, we include music in these videos, and I think they do an awesome job, and I'm thankful for that music in these online services. But it's not exactly the same as singing with others. Because my guess is, no, I might be wrong, my guess is a lot of us just sort of listen to it, but we don't participate in it. But when you're in a big room of people, or maybe if you're watching this with a large group of people and you sing along with the songs, you're having this experience, but there's something deeply relational about singing these truths together. I, I, I love pulling my kids close to me when we're singing songs in church together on Sundays. I, I, I love hearing people singing and that, that noise and their, their worship just wash over the back of me. I love seeing little Zion Vossler kind of like squirming and running around or, or Christian Barty on Christmas Eve in a cute little sweater. Like there's just... 
we're being knit together. We're singing to God, but we're also speaking to one another. If you're an older person who's part of our church, let's say you're like north of retirement age, we need your singing. See, children, I was thinking about this morning, children, they just sort of sing, right? Like, have you ever noticed? They just sort of singing in the car seat. They're singing at the, they're just always sort of singing. They're making up songs. They're just, they, they have like this little naive beauty about them, right? Where they just kind of believe God's good. I'm loved. Everything's going to turn out in the end, right? They just sort of sing. It's just like a thing that they do. But it seems to me that some of us, as we get a little bit older, we tend to stop caring as much about music and about singing. Oh, we still kind of like it, but but we don't see it as just like this natural, normal thing that we do. Well, here's what I want you to hear. Those of us who are not yet to, to your age or retirement age or whatever, we need you to sing. Not naively, but wisely, thoughtfully, boldly, knowing that God is good and he loves you and everything is going to turn out in the end. I need that from you and I know that many of us do. I was on a boat uh, on the Sea of Galilee. I don't know why I'm stuck in Israel in these last couple of illustrations, but one of our older saints who's north of retirement age was sitting next to me. And as we were singing as a group together on that boat, I could hear her just going for it. And when she was doing that, my... My heart was about to explode. It was so powerful because I know that everything's not perfect in her life. I know that things are challenging in, in a different way, maybe at her age than at my age, but here she was just declaring the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for her. So singing is so relational. We need to be singing together to each other, addressing each other. Lastly, singing is reciprocal. Perhaps the most powerful thing about song and singing is that we are not the only ones singing. Look at this verse in, in Zephaniah chapter 3. This is what it says. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. God sings over us. Our singing to him is met by his singing back over us. You know, I, I think for some of us, even if we've been Christians for years, we struggle and we think that God just is sort of like disappointed in us or Maybe that he accepts us because we believe in Jesus, but he's sort of like, oh man, we're not really crazy about that person, but I guess they're in the family. Like we have this idea of God that is totally different than what the biblical idea is here. I, I love this quote from the book Desiring God. It says this, when God, by his love of benevolence, saves us and counts us righteous in Christ and gives us the Holy Spirit, he begins a work of transformation that restores aspects of our personhood which are delightful to him, pleasing to him, which he genuinely likes about us. This is what God is doing in sanctification. You might say sanctification is God making us likable and pleasing. As God's spirit dwells in us and makes us more like Christ, it truly pleases God. We are pleasing to God, so much so that he exalts and sings over us. We are treasures to him. As Christ is precious to the Father, we become precious as we become more like Jesus. This, this is the good news, that God loves us, and in Christ, he likes us. He, he, he likes turning us, restoring us, renewing us, turning us into the people that he longs for us to be like, like a parent delights in his children. Every time we sing, we should be reminded that our singing is met with God singing. It's like lovers singing their song of love to one another, that God sings back over us. 
Although I was a little bit nervous to sing in front of that Jamaican couple, and I don't know that I did a very good job. In fact, if I could go back, I'd really have just gone for and committed. But, but I was nervous to sing in front of them. It was kind of awkward and weird. But there were some folks that I've never been nervous to sing in front of. Certainly not when they were younger, and that's my kids. I mean, when my kids were really, really little, I may only have a mediocre or small amount of musical talent, but I have a large amount of love and joy in my children. And so I would just sing over them. And so with my wife, I would, I'd catch her singing a lullaby to one of our boys. I'd be singing for them. Sometimes they'd be fun songs we're dancing around and sometimes they'd be quiet songs trying to get them to sleep. And I was doing that before they could do anything cool, really. I mean, they were just little stinky, crabby babies. They were babies, they don't do anything. And yet I was like in love. And so my heart would just burst in delight and joy and I would just sing over them. Well, more than any doting parent has ever delighted in their child, your heavenly father loves you and sings over you because of how good Jesus is. Yeah, yeah, the world's a dangerous place. It's almost like it's drunk at times. But the Holy Spirit is trying to fill us with affection and understanding of who this Jesus is. And then out of us should come singing, recognizing that our great God is actually singing over us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that not only do you rescue me, but you restore me to make me the person that I was always intended to be, that you're, you're turning me more and more into the likeness of Christ and that it fills your heart with joy, even as I'm filled with joy. God, may we be a singing people in our cars. May we crank up the worship music and sing at the top of our lungs and get awkward looks from passers-by. In our church, may we lift up the truths of the gospel and song and sing over each other, whether we're younger or older. God, may we do this together, recognizing that this is not just a thing to do or pass some time. It's not even just a small thing. It's a big deal. You have given us this opportunity to sing together. Now, may we do that, whether it's with a video or it's in person, recognizing we're not the only ones singing. You sing over us today. We thank you for Jesus and we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, we hope today's service has been a blessing for you. Saint, would you close us with a verse? Absolutely. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 11 says, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Have a great week, everyone.